You're listening to a Pop House Network podcast for developers by developers. Hello and welcome to the Stack Podcast episode number 58, recorded on April 8th, 2022. My name is Keto Man and I'm here with a few co-hosts. Welcome, Josh Juno. Hey, how are you doing? Good. My name is Josh Good. Juno. Uh, I'm Javi Jacardi developer by day, also an Oracle database administrator and uh, author and open source contributor by night, uh, member of the CJUG board, Apache NetBeans PMC and Java champion. Woohoo, I, I, I love a long list of cool things. <laughs> All right, Dano, welcome. Ah, thank you. How's it going? <laughs> okay. My name's Dano. Um, I just do stuff. <laughs> Uh, I There's tweet stuff <laughs> I tweet I tweet somewhere along the way I end up doing some code and uh, and uh, good stuff like that well, but so and what, do podcasts what, what is your Twitter what is your Twitter handle for those who want to follow you John? oh yeah at, uh, at D H I N O J O S A so if you need to know my Wordle scores and my <laughs> and my world world score. So uh, I don't know if you know this, but I'm a I'm a geography fanatic, and uh, I could uh, draw the U.S. map and, and it used to be like under a minute. It's probably a little bit over a minute now, and um, I just liked looking at atlases. I thought for sure I was going to be hired at Rand McNally. Like I thought that was just the job that I was destined for, or a weatherman. That neither happened. But uh, love maps. So if you've never played Worldle, uh, there's that one. So there's I put my scores there on. Worldle, yeah. So they show a picture of a country or an island. I I mess up the islands because I mean islands are just dots and water, but like uh, countries with distinct shapes. Boom, man, I usually I usually average around one. Sometimes they'll they'll be two or three. Uh, the ones that mess me up are like small countries like Latvia, where they expand. And I'm not used to seeing it enlarged, <laughs> small countries enlarged. I'm like, the heck is this country? So that's the one that messes me up too. But Worldle, so spell Worldle, World, and then put an L-E at the end of it. Okay, nice. nice. Yeah. So uh, just just b before we get to, to Ian, I, I, there's one more thing. Um, I, I actually know someone that did used to work, that actually used to, uh, was just to build maps and work for like map quests and stuff. So uh, dreamy. And, and he actually knows how to like, you know, draw maps by hand and stuff. So, uh, so I'm, I'm sure you guys will get along very well. Now he's doing crypto stuff though. So, <laughs> all right, Dano, I mean, uh, Ian, God, I, I really <laughs> haven't had that many drinks yet. Um, Ian. Uh, yeah, I know how you feel. Uh, hey guys, Ian here. Uh, Java developer, full stack developer now, basically uh, Angular and Java and uh, Agile and Scrum enthusiast. I'm an author, Java instructor, uh, speaker. And right now just uh, actually exploring other languages, Swift and uh, a lot of Mac based uh, programming. Um, yeah, I drank way too much coffee today, so I'm a little wired, but uh, I'm happy. So I'm happy to be here. Uh, my contribution to the whole Wordle thing, I played it once. I liked it. Uh, there's a lot of variations. You guys heard of Symantl? That's another one I've, I've discovered recently. Um, that's where you have to pick the word, but using like uh, words that are semantically related to the word that you're trying to guess. So, for example, one of them I had to guess the word was rocket. So I ended up like, it took me a lot of guesses, but satellite star space station you know all these things are like you're getting close you're getting close so semantle that's another uh one of these word games if you like that forces you to think a little bit outside the box uh because you can't like yeah eventually you have to guess the word but you know semantically related um but yeah uh what's what's new with me just uh like i said i'm working on uh, a couple side projects right now i'm excited about it, but you know i won't i won't say too much it's been a lot of long time coming and hopefully I'll be, be having some news about that soon, but mm, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll update you in the future. Oh, cool. And I'm also really excited. Matt Rabel is here, guys. How amazing is that? <laughs> this is one yes, of my he heroes. Is. Yes. So, so our, our special guest today is Mr. Matt Rabel, the, uh, a, a, a Java extraordinaire. <laughs> so welcome to the show matt 
Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So uh, I I could say lots about Matt. Um, he's been around forever, like us, um, but also had a lot of great open source contributions and someone we've seen over many years at many conferences back in the day. So so Matt, give us like a like a quick like synopsis of of who Matt is. Um, who, who is Matt Rabel, uh, and, uh, and and what are you doing these days? So I grew up as a, you know, a hick from the sticks in the backwoods of Montana with no electricity, no running water, and I had to walk two miles to the bus stop every day. I did not know that. <laughs> you didn't? That's how I opened my talks all the time. Yeah, he had a <laughs> hand crank. He had one of those hand crank computers. That's how he got his start. <laughs> well, the funny thing was my dad was into computers, so we actually had Byte Magazine, but still mm. no electricity, right? We had a subscription, but uh, he got us like a generator and a Commodore 64 in the late 80s, and he always wow. kind of, you know, tried to teach me programming and I was never oh, that interested man. until I learned it paid a lot. And then I was like, oh, I'm interested. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? Those um, those magazines took us far. And uh, I don't know, maybe I'm getting nostalgic no, now. Byte but... was like incredible. I remember reading yeah. about like like uh, chip architectures. And, and Byte. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, and they had that then. They had the schematics on there. And yeah. then, uh, my uncle had uh, passed away in July. And he's the one that introduced me to all this. He got me a VIC 20, uh, helped get me a Commodore 64. So, so, uh, he was the one that got me interested in all this. He passed away and the family's like, just give these bite magazines to Dan. He'll love it. And it's just like from 1975 oh, to nice. 82. And like what people were dreaming about was just, ah, uh, just uh, amazing. Just like, here's this here's this floppy drive that goes faster than some of the others. Can you imagine what we could do as humanity, like getting some of these devices and oh, man, nice. it's just like, it's great tapping into like everybody's, you know, technical dreams at the time. Cause yeah. you know, people had a bright future. Yeah. You know, I, I've got I a huge that. collection of old magazines, but I don't go back that far. I think mine's right. still like late eighties, you know, when, when I was yeah. old enough to get them. So that's right. Awesome. Yeah. Josh? Did you guys ever uh, key in those assembler programs and figure oh, out like, yeah. the game? Sure. Like, it's not I the coolest thing. The hex, I wish the I hex had. Code? No. Yeah, no, it was like 2A, yeah, 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 0F. Yeah. And then I'm you're listening. like, after you did like the five pages, you're like, damn it, it didn't work. And then you're just yeah. going back to read it again. My, mine worked and it was like magic. This like All of a sudden this platforming game appeared on my screen. And I just thought, this is the coolest thing ever, man. This is like, I just typed in a bunch of random characters and then I have a game like that was cool. Right, uh, you, totally. you should see my my eight year old make platform games on Scratch now. <laughs> like, <laughs> but it's, it's like every time I turn around, there's some new like random creation he's made. Like whether it's something he made himself or something that he he you can like remix other people's stuff on there, which is oh, kind of right. cool. Yeah. It's like it's that like open cool. source essentially. It's like it's sort of like forking a repo and playing with it. You know. Oh. Right. Right. Totally. Um, so well they used to like take pictures of computers and that was one of the things that these were almost like the same way they did supermodels to like get you to buy clothes or whatever <laughs> like they would do the lighting they had a wonderful desk lamp they had like a coffee mug and then they had like a, a programming manual open and a nice clean computer with the monitor next to it and it it drew me in like it was so effective that i'm like wow i wish i could have that set up like it's a computer magazine, but it drew me in. We don't we don't see those advertisements anymore that just you know bring us in like that. No, that's kind yeah. of cool. And it, I remember like I was sick and looking at a magazine, and it was introducing the new t uh, Apple Two C, mm -hmm. and it was like beautiful, and it was just like can't afford it, but I could dream, can't I? Yeah, <laughs> right. absolutely great. So so Matt Matt was reading Byte magazines in the dark. Right. And then I, yeah. I went to college and uh, I went to the University of Denver, which is where my shirt is from for the hockey team. Um, and I studied Russian international business and finance. And then I spent a couple summers in Russia. I got pretty full in the language. And uh, and then I decided I didn't really want to live there. And uh, and I had a friend who was doing computer science, like a roommate. And I was like, well, maybe I'll just go into that. Right. So I started auditing classes. Uh, enough that I got a job and I had kind of done HTML and CSS and all that just as a hobby. And so I ended up learning enough that I got to be a Y2K consultant, which isn't a very good job, right? Because it's got a finite ending. And uh, I did that for six months. And then I ended up being like a, 
what they called a webmaster back in the day for CoBank, which is still in Denver. And uh, and then I was a contractor and I kind of just continued from there and I ended up being an HTML developer at a startup that turned me into a Java developer. And I like studied all and got all the certifications and stuff like that. And then I left that job and ended up as an independent consultant where they were like, we need a web framework. Um, we need you to develop like the UI. And that same month, Struts 1.0 came out, right? This is like 2001 in June. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, let's just use Struts. And it worked. And that like launched my whole career, just, you know, getting into open source and, you know, writing about it and blogging about it. I started a blog in 2002. And, you know, I, my blog was originally like Stack Overflow. I just post all my questions there and people would answer them. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, having a... Uh, being a roller committer as well, which is a blog software I used, helped a lot because what Roller did is it it shipped to everyone and they installed it and ran it, right? But it had like my blog linked on the default like Roller installation. Oh, cool. So I, I think that's a big reason why, you know, I got a lot of links in the in the beginning there or a lot of hits. Yeah. I remember Roller. But just so, so for those who don't know, Roller was, was like one of the first like blog servers, but it was it was all Java. Um, right. right, and it's still available. It's Apache Roller now, right? Yeah. If you go to roller.apache.org, yeah. yeah. it's there. I remember playing with it a few years ago. I was still getting old back then, <laughs> but but yeah, that's awesome. Nice, it's fantastic. That's one of my claims to fame is I've never actually moved my blog somewhere else. Right, it's huh. always been there since two thousand two, <laughs> and it should have been in like the log for shell situation or the spring for shell. But I checked and I haven't upgraded in so long that it wasn't vulnerable to any of that. Right, <laughs> right. right. Like I still use Log4j1 and Spring is like a Java 9 and above and I'm using Java 8. So yeah, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. It's not to say you shouldn't upgrade your things, but that's one hey, benefit of not upgrading. I know, yeah. I'm, I'm like the biggest proponent of updating things and I update <laughs> like all the projects I maintain like weekly or monthly. And this is like we the one that I've actually shunned and it's worked out well. Yeah. Yep. Hey, we you know your weakness, so you. Yeah. What's that? He actually has a recent post. I didn't know you posted it. No, yeah, the, the dude keeps keeps rolling on roller. The yes. um, uh, it's uh the uh the funny thing is like you can't strongly advocate new Java since uh since your blog is still like <laughs> on, the, <laughs> on the same stuff. Hey, you should really upgrade the Java. Why you don't you don't upgrade your your, right, uh, you're your not. blog? No, it's on my list. I definitely need to. But I've had a, a nice situation this year because in Java, right? We haven't had many like CVEs or anything like posted about any frameworks in a long time. And this year, we've had like two in the last six months, right? So yeah, yeah, it's been kind of weird. Yeah, it's a good point. Going going back to to struts. Wow, guys, like uh, that takes me back. So another big project of Matt's that I. I have to say was very influential in my career was the was app fuse i want to talk about that for a sec because matt you you were such a big help for me at that stage of my career i was trying to figure out how did how do these pieces all fit together struts spring hibernate you know what, mm -hmm. what what do you do with all that stuff how do you build applications and i asked the internet and some guy said app fuse that was it that was the the starting point and so i ran this tool i downloaded this thing app fuse ran it and it spat out this beautiful looking project, this code that's like, wow, so that's where you put the stuff. And this is what you call these things, right? Like your services and your uh, DAOs and your, uh, and your, your, v your UI, your, your middleware, if you want, like uh, spring layer, your, your uh, data access layer. And it just started all coming together for me. So, you know, t tell us about how, how you got involved with AppFuse, if you don't mind. I'm really curious. Yeah, so the whole inspiration for that was Eric Hatcher's Java Development with Ant book. And that's uh, that's probably the most influential book in my life because it inspired me to like create AppFuse, right? And the whole reason I created it was just because a lot of the architectures I saw at the time involved like EJBs, right? This is like early 2000s. And I was like, like, I've never had to do EJBs and I don't want to start, right? That was my feeling at the time because, you know, other people on projects I worked on did them and it just was confusing and weird and stuff like that. And so... You know, with AppFuse, the first like hurdle was was figuring out how you generate like code from XDocLet, right? I don't know if anyone remembers XDocLet, but that was like that was what AppFuse did and did well was take you know your POJOs and generate all the code from it. And so I think you know part of the reason it was successful and a lot of people used it was because I developed it like learning in public. 
right? Like every time I got a new feature or whatever, I'd blog about it and uh, ended up having a bunch of committers, but I ended up doing like most of the work myself. So as far as like open source project, it wasn't very good, right? Like you want an open source project where everyone contributes, right? Not just like one main person, but um, it did like, I used it on a couple of projects. I had a, a gig at Comcast for a bit there in 2002 or three, where we actually used it as like the foundation for the project we were building. And yeah, it was a lot of fun, but it was a, it was, it was a crazy time for me because I basically worked on like four clients, 40 hours a week. And then I would work on app like 40 hours a week. Like I wasn't doing it right. Right. As like a work-life balance thing. Wow. But yeah, man, what a, what an amazing contribution to the Java community. You just yeah, like really definitely. helped a lot of people, I think, figure out, you know, how to, how to start do, doing development because the, the, I remember in my one year I was taking a Perl programming course and the, the, the teacher was saying like, so Perl's great. You know, he was a guru, you knew it inside note. We talked about Java one day and he said, yeah, Java learning curve is a vertical wall. Okay. So yeah. it's like, that was the, that was the, the barrier to entry for a lot of it for us. You know, the, a lot of developers, I think looking at Java, like what, how do I even start with this language? And, you know, your, your tool just kind of put everything in the right place and made it easy to understand. I think, you know, how do you organize your source code? How do these frameworks fit together conceptually too? Like, what do you, what do you name things? Like naming things is so important, right? Like, you call something yeah. a service, you know, it, it implies certain things, it's statelessness and uh, composability and um, just the, the design of the code, right? So thank you for that. Yeah, thanks for your contribution with AppFuse. I helped a lot. So well, it's I funny was... because really the reason it was, uh, you know, followed a lot of those patterns is at the time, I think because of blogging, I had a lot of feedback from people that actually worked on the frameworks, like Gavin King, right? We'd exchange emails about how I was using Hibernate and stuff, and he would offer tips for improvement, right? Like Ted Houston from the Struts Project would be like, hey, you're you're doing this wrong. You should rename your classes, right? And it's spring, right? I talked to Rod Johnson. Like, it was just such a, a way of communicating with people that work so well. And now, you know, we've moved on to Twitter, but I still think, like, blogging is is such an important thing for a person's career if they use it correctly, right? Or do you think do you think it's a, a lost art blogging like there's something humanity is missing by moving away from blogging and going to micro blogging no but i think for us as like writers it's a huge like thing if you can write a lot right i still blog all the time but i do it on the octa developer blog right like i'm still publishing you know 10 to 15 posts a year or trying to and right. uh and so like the writing is just it's almost therapeutic you know like, I like the personal blogs because you're not like procrastinating yeah. on those, right? You're not like, mm -hmm. I have to figure out this technology to write this tutorial. You're like, I'm just right. telling a story. And so I think, you know, it's similar to, you know, speaking, right? That that's very therapeutic as well. Like just being able to communicate your thoughts and, you know, if you can right. do it via writing, then yeah. And I think there's yeah. still a lot of bloggers out there. I mean, for us, it's, it's a huge source of traffic. Right. So even though sure. maybe we're not writing as many blog posts as we used to, we used to like there's still a lot of people reading them, you know? Oh, yeah. Right. I mean, and that's still very largely how people learn stuff. They search yes. how to do X, Y, Z. And then they yeah. find whatever whatever the top three results are. They pick one and then they read it, you know? Yeah. Right. Um, speaking so of, uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Josh. Sorry. As speaking of uh, Matt's famous writing example, so Mark, one of yeah. the most famous one was the comparing the web frameworks blog post, right? I remember right. that you kind of lit lit a match there and threw it in the, uh, you know, threw threw some doused it with fuel because that that was like a huge topic back in the late, you know, two thousands. The uh, smackdowns, if I remember that's that it. was the like, term. Yeah. Who is the, which web framework is it going to be? Is it uh, Grails? Is it uh, Struts? Is it, uh, this is a little bit before JSF came into the picture, but um, uh, Wicked, I remember all these different uh, yeah. frameworks and, and you, you seem to understand all of them, Matt. Like, how did you get your head around like all these different web frameworks? That was AppFuse, right? We integrated them all in AppFuse. So I had to learn them to like do it. And I had, you know, people helping along the way, but what I loved about that talk is it was the first talk I ever did like in a big audience, right? And it was at ApacheCon 2004 and I did it for 10 years, like 10 freaking years. Like wow. I took a couple a couple years off when uh, I got divorced from the old practice wife in like 2007 there. But like I met Trish in 2010 and it was the first time I had ever like submitted to speak overseas and it was DevOps, right? In Antwerp. And I submitted that talk 
And then Trish got to go with me and it was just, it was amazing for her because it was already a popular talk, right? Like I had done it for so many years that, you know, everyone showed up for it and she's like, who's this Matt Rabel guy? This is kind of strange. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. pretty awesome. It's, it's yeah. kind of interesting because like we always like joke about JavaScript. It's been zero days since JavaScript created a new web framework. But that was us. Like that was the oh, Java yeah. group. Yeah. Java was like, hey, new framework, everyone. Like we just dropped it. And it's uh, right. always kind of interesting looking back. Like we're parents. Like yeah, Java programmers are parents in JavaScript. Oh, the, I remember my youth. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's funny too, because my my stance on that is sort of similar. Like I'm, you know, I'm I've always been a standards guy. So back in the day, I was all into Java server faces because that was a standard. And at least there was theoretically multiple companies, you know, behind it. Um, and nowadays with all the JavaScript frameworks, it's like uh, I've worked on projects do using different ones. But I, if I have a choice, I just use web components and TypeScript because web components are built into the browser and it's a standard. And then I'm not stuck with whatever framework, you know, I have, I have more flexibility. Um, yeah. Like but, Keto and I need to do a SmackDown because he's always been standards guy and I've always been framework guy. Right? <laughs> yes, you're right. You're right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and then you yeah. have a. You can submit something for Java One in the fall. You know. Ah, oh, that could be good. Oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so, jump, jumping back to we won't spend too much time in the past, but jumping back to around, like 2006, <laughs> that was the first release of facelets, right? Let's talk about that era. Oh yeah. Jake or Bukum, right? So mm -hmm. talking about standards and frameworks. So this this guy is genius, I think. For Personally, I wrote about his yeah. contribution, uh, uh, Jacob's uh, insights and his work, you know, at the early stages of Facelets uh, 2006. So we were exchanging ideas on on message uh, uh, on um, a mailing list. And, you know, I was really excited about what he was doing because he was taking XML and combining it with uh, with a web framework, a component based web framework. So you have the standard which was the, the great thing about it. It was like it's XML. OK, so it's, you know, you know what it's going to it's syntactically clean. You know what you're looking at. It's not some uh, homegrown uh, markup language or expression language or something, right? And and it's fast too. Like he was using the Sax parser to go and uh, create a, a DOM of uh, components and, and render HTML. And I thought this is genius stuff. And uh, so that that was also in the background. You know, we had tapestry and tiles, and this is just before JSF kind of was born. So. What were your thoughts around that time, Matt? Were you were you observing those kind of developments in the in the framework uh, environment community? Oh, yeah. or? I I have the perfect blog post for you. So I googled because I remember the title, and it's called JSF still sucks, and it's got <laughs> with a question mark, and uh, it's referring to another blog post where someone. This is like April sixteenth, two thousand seven, and uh, it's funny because I basically say if you're going to use JSF, I highly recommend facelets or shale or seam, right? Because yeah. those are like coming out at the time as well. And uh, yeah, because just the, the JSP version of JSF was terrible, right? And it gave oh, yeah, them yeah. like a bad taste in their mouth and like the whole like post everything to keep the state. Like there was a lot of things that were like anti-web when it first came out. And so yes. this, this whole post is basically like agreeing with them and then telling people to use facelets. And then, uh, you know, you could also help improve JSF 2.0, right? And so that was like my ending thing. Um, nice. So yeah, it's uh it's one of those things that I think uh it was it's really bad timing. I don't know if you know this, but 2004 in April, there was JSF 1.0 release, there was Spring MVC 1.0, and there was Flex 1.0, all in that like mm. same one month period. And then like jQuery came out of the blue in like 2005 and just blew it all up. Right, 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 right. Right. And Ajax like the coin was termed and stuff and I think Spring MVC was kind of okay with that, right? Cuz they were like server side and if you want to decorate it with jQuery, great. And JSF was totally like, oh, we didn't see this coming. <laughs> you know, you know <laughs> what? Like I think you used to embrace it. Yeah, I never really thought about it. But yeah, jQuery was probably the reason why the JavaScript community has started just like blossoming after that point and framework started happening and front end was no longer a Java thing. This oh, was nice. going to be owned by JavaScript. And I think jQuery, because everything is still jQuery. Someone had made kind of like a, one of those jokes that have like everything grounded in truth and that everything is still jQuery. Like no matter what kind of web frameworks or anything that gets developed, it's still all jQuery. jQuery was 
well, was the thing that pushed it. It was a JavaScript I mean, renaissance, right? It started the yeah, whole JavaScript yeah. renaissance. Yeah. yeah. And right. it's also a good example of of, of uh, evolving standards, right? So a lot of the stuff like, you know, there's now document that query selector. Hmm. <laughs> Where did that come from? Right. You know, right. there's there's all sorts of, of enhancements on the overall platform that would never have happened if jQuery had existed. You know, right. Right. Um, yeah. I, I I should mention um, just uh, in the show notes I I did put a link to to AppFuse because it's actually on GitHub. <laughs> um, right. So, so and, many there's so many jumping off points in the, at this stage, guys. We could talk about Spring for <laughs> Shell. We could talk about uh, JHipster, which obviously is supposed to be Matt's recommendation to stop using AppFuse. You could talk about that. We could talk about selectors, query selectors. So where do we go from here? Well, let's well, let's, I, let's throw in. I, I know what you're going to say, Dan. No, I was gonna. I was just gonna mention uh, what what Matt does now is almost very, 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 very similar to what he did with AppFuse, I think. Uh, mm. And that's J Hipster. I don't know if you want to go that route, but that one is is kind of similar in spirit in that you say go, and there you are. You've got a, a quick app. But anyway, you decide which pathway you want to go. Keto. Yeah, you, know, you you've you've already opened the box. That's a great time. All right, Matt, you're uh, on the spot now. Jay Hipster. Okay. Yeah, so I'm very grateful because the the founder of Jay Hipster, Julian Dubois, does like say it was inspired by AppView. So when he says that, that it works oh, nice. hard, obviously. Oh, yeah. wow, okay. <laughs> yeah, wow. but Jay Hipster is basically a full stack, right? So you generate your back end and, and Spring Boot, and then your front end's Angular, React, or Vue. We support all three of those. We even have Ionic and React Native. Uh, what we call blueprints so you can override the default behavior and use this blueprint there's also blueprints for a nest js backend or a .NET core or corcus and micronet right so it's really like blossomed and the ecosystem's really grown and you know the thing that jay hipster's done really well that i didn't do with AppFuse was just foster like a community of developers right that are enthusiastic and you know working on the project and stuff and we've had people that are are very prolific right they're committing thousands of lines a week but they kind of come and go, right? They do it for like a year and then they realize they have a family and they're like, oh, I shouldn't be doing this, right? I should be <laughs> spending more time with them. And, uh, but with Okta, working for Okta, we started like uh, their sponsorship program and like donating money to it. And Jay Hipsters raised over $200,000 uh, from sponsors and paid out like in bug bounties and stuff to people that work on it. Oh, that's, oh, that's awesome. amazing. I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah. That's wow. Cool. And it looks like you have a, a J Hipster mini book as well. So I'll put that in the show notes, Matt. Yeah. Yeah, it's and a little you, outdated, but I got to update it soon. So and I don't know if this is standard wardrobe, but I think this is more like costumes that you wear whenever you do J Hipster. Like uh you you actually change wardrobe and have a, a different <laughs> persona. Is that correct? So it's it's my favorite talk that I've ever done. The first time I did it was at Denver Jug just as like a practice thing. And then I did it on stage at DevOx in Belgium again. And it was uh, changing from a old fashioned Java developer to a Java hipster. So I begin with like a scotch or a whiskey, right? Cause I'm old fashioned. I got like an ascot tie on and then my collar is all up and stuff like that. And when I've done it good, I actually get temporary tattoos of like angular and spring boot on my neck. So as oh, nice. I transform into this hipster, right? Like people are like, holy shit, he's got tattoos, right? They're not real, but they think they're real. <laughs> and by the end, I'm drinking a PBR because in the US, you know, a hipster drinks right. PBR. And That's it's right. been funny speaking in other countries because if you whip out a PBR, like in Sweden, they're going to be like, why the hell are you drinking a PBR, right? That's not cool at all. And so I've had to adapt it to get a good beer from their local, you know, place to drink that at the end. Oh, that's great. Yes. You just do so, this for refreshments, I think. I, I'm not sure it's about the. <laughs> I'm not sure it's about the tech. <laughs> well, it it actually like it it makes the talk totally different because the costume like it becomes more of a performance, which is what a talk should be, more so than you know you reading no, the slides right. or whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, just just to say a little more about Jay Hipster, I'm I'm looking at the little uh, site here because I, I did not realize there were so many different blueprints. Now. Um, in my, in my head, it's still Angular and Spring Boot. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but but it says the goal is uh, to generate a complete and modern web app or, mic or, or microservice architecture unifying a high-performance and robust server-side stack with excellent test coverage, a sleek modern mobile-first UI with Angular, Re React, or Vue plus Bootstrap for CSS, 
a powerful workflow to build your application with Webpack and Maven or Gradle. And that, that's always very handy. A resilient microservice architecture with cloud native principles in mind and infrastructure as code so you can deploy to the cloud. Woohoo! Nice. So, so when you deploy to the cloud, uh, Matt, I, I don't know anything about JHipster really. Uh, except the name, uh, but uh, like, so you have really just, uh, you have the front end, you have uh, the back end, which is Spring Boot or Quarkus. Uh, yep. Do you deploy it as one single unit or do you have the option to uh, like deploy to Kubernetes or wherever you'd like as separate units or you have your choice? Uh, it's all jar file, right? So that's why we aren't susceptible to Spring for Shell because that's wars, right? And we oh, haven't okay. done wars in years. Um, right. But basically, you know, everything ends up as a jar artifact. But what we do, and now everyone does, is Docker containers, right? And then yes. who cares, right? But but the front end and the back end typically live together in the same artifact. Um, you can separate them, but from a security perspective, we believe that you know the back end for front end model is the best because you can do all your authentication on the back end. You can store your tokens there and stuff like that, and you don't have to expose them to your client. And you use good old session cookies because guess what? Those have worked for twenty years. No one's really had a problem with them and all the fan companies still do it that way. So obviously yeah. it scales, right? There's not a scalability oh, wow. issue there. I, I like how you're uh, aging and becoming a grumpy old man about like <laughs> session cookies. You're like, let me tell you something, young man. We loved our session cookies and that's the way right. we ran and that's the way we do it now. If you <laughs> see me start tweeting like James Ward, then you know I fully turned grumpy. That's right, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to ask a I'd like to ask a question on that one. So um, yeah, I like the I've worked with that architecture before. You know, the same sit back in for front end, like uh, single artifact deployment with UI and API. And yeah, you can you can protect the 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 UI from you know uh, authentication. You can add your authorization layer around it. Uh, but you also work for Okta, so you know about like OIDC and OAuth two and all these modern authentication and authorization uh, approaches, right? So how do those, how do you reconcile those, Matt? Like what, what would you, if you were taking a step back today, just like clean slate, uh, whiteboard, you know, starting from scratch, how would you design an application? I know it's a big question, but would you, would you separate the, the, the concerns or would you, uh, for convenience, you know, still go with the single artifact? I think Jay Hipster is like a great example of like what I believe, because when I started working on it, right, it was mostly because I was writing a book on it and just found bugs, right? And then after finding bugs for a year, they were like, hey, you wanna actually you know, contribute the fixes? And I was like, okay, I can help with that. But I, it goes back to when I joined Okta. So um, I had worked for StormPath before and then Okta bought StormPath. With StormPath, their uh, like authentication mechanism was, was embedded. So when you added the StormPath Spring Boot starter to your project, it actually would render like time leaf templates right in your project it wouldn't make a call out to the server until you clicked on submit but it did all that through like back end code right it didn't actually do it for the front end and so um, when i started working for okta it was basically like it was a different like setup right they supported oidc they supported oauth2 so i was like well jay hipster says they support oauth2 so i'll just go in and modify it so it works with okta right and what i found is jay hipster had a authorization server built by spring security like as part of the project so you were doing OAuth, but you were actually your own IDP kind of thing. Mm. And then the client ID and client secret were stored in the JavaScript code, right? And storing a client secret anywhere, even, you know, in GitHub is a bad idea, right? So like within, you know, three days of diving into this project to, you know, make it work with Okta, I was like, holy shit, this needs to be ripped out and replaced, right? This is not good. And so that's where we, we adopted Keycloak, right, to have like, still a local OAuth server that you could use, but then made it work with like Okta and Auth0 over the years. And uh, and it was just an eye-opening experience. And, and people have argued with me all the time about like, hey, we should use an Angular OIDC library to actually do the authentication on the front end, then it's stateless and everything like that. And then you just send the JWT to the back end. And the reason we originally did it on the back end is because then you don't have to write it for the front end, right? You don't have to get a React OIDC library. You don't need a view, right, right, you don't need right. an Angular mm -hmm. one. And there wasn't anything that existed that crossed all three of them, right? So it was kind of just a strategic thing in the beginning, but you know, it's five, six years later now, and it's still like a solid choice because the security is more secure. You're getting those right. access tokens and ID tokens from Okta or Auth0 or Keycloak, but you're storing them in the server in a session. So it's never leaking any of that information, right? And so what I typically tell developers is like, if you wanna do your authentication on the client, that makes sense if you have no server. 
But if you have a server lake, why are you making things less secure? That just seems right, right, right. No, that's a great point. I have so many questions for you. We don't have infinite time. So I want to jump to another one. Angular or Reactor View, it says right here on your uh, JHipster tech stack page. So, you know, Web Framework uh, Showdown 2.0, what, what's your take? Angular or Reactor View? Which one do you like and why? Uh, or Svelte. The funny story I have about that is I was recently interviewed and the person asked the same thing and my response basically made him take out the whole question in my answers because I just wrote a book on Angular. So I was like, I know this one best and here's my book. And they were like, yeah, we're not going to advertise for you. But um, I've worked the longest with Angular, right? But uh, but of like the posts at Okta that I've written, like there's a lot of Spring Boot and React and Spring Boot and Vue that developers just eat up, right? Like we get tons of hits on those posts like every month. And my personal opinion is like, once you learn React, it really makes a lot of sense. Like it's easy to like pull out components and put them in another file. And like Angular is more of like a framework thing. So as soon as you know the framework, it works well. Um, but React is almost like intuitive to me, you know, after I started using it. Vue is great too. I think a lot of people that are, you know, JavaScript like heavy and like JavaScript, they will, you know, be in heaven with Vue. And I haven't worked much with Svelte, but we do have a jhipster blueprint for it. Nice. My, my first impression of React personally, I love Angular. I've been working with Angular for years and I'm definitely an Angular guy, but I'm very interested in other frameworks too. My first impression was React. with React was, this is spaghetti code. What, what is this? Some uh, HTML element embedded in JavaScript basically, right? How do you- It was like JSPs that? back in the day and we were like, oh, this is so gross, right? Yeah. And there was yeah. a huge reaction. I don't know if you remember, it was uh, like 2014, right? It was when Angular was like, hey, we're going to do version two and it's going to take us two years. And everyone was like, well, we don't have two years. We're going to go use something else, right? So everyone went over to React and then they were like, this JSX is weird. Why are we putting, you know, markup in our code? And uh, five years later, no one cares anymore, right? So interesting. Um, well, and and the thing about it too is that it's 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 like a lot of things. It's the same but different, right? It's like it's like yeah, you are you can mix the two, but it's there's actually a separation. It's not like you can mix them all together throughout everything like you can in JSP. <laughs> you can make a big pile right. where you know you, you can't. It just happens to be in the same file, really. You know. And and for me, when when I I've done um, a decent amount with uh, Lit uh, and Lit HTML, and they used uh, tag template literals, so it, it's pure TypeScript or JavaScript, but you're still embedding all the markup in the same file, right? And you basically can just reference variables the same way you can with with uh, JSX. So it's like, you know, I I, I like that a little better because it's actually not um, some weird new thing that requires a different compiler you can compile it with anything but right it's the same idea you know um and i i agree at first when i start looking i actually have not written a lot of react but i've worked in a lot of react projects so i read a lot of it and work with it a lot and tweak things but i've never been on a project where i have to write a whole bunch of react code um but uh yeah it, at first i looked at it and i was like i i don't get it and now now i get it it's a little more functional. I'm much more used to the Angular, more OO style, because I've worked on a lot of Angular stuff. Um, and React is certainly more functional, but especially with if you use hooks instead of the React classes and all that kind of stuff. So, but uh, but yeah, I get it. Yeah. It, it makes sense, especially now that you don't have to use um, you don't have to use Redux in order to actually write a React app. You can use React context and stuff. It's less of a pain in the butt. So interesting. Looking at our, our show notes here, we, so talking about <laughs> JavaScript frameworks, uh, TypeScript, uh, the Twitter account. Uh, Dan, do you want to update, fill us in on, on what's going on with Oracle's JavaScript Twitter handle? Yeah, maybe? so this is weird. Um, so one of the things that uh, our audience may uh, may not have heard of is uh, back a long time ago that Oracle owned the copyright to Java, and they thought, you know, Let's just go ahead and own a, a JavaScript, which I don't think, and uh, somebody could correct me if I'm wrong, there wasn't like actually a JavaScript yet. In fact, I thought it was, it was all, the official term has always been ECMAScript, uh, but then they, they adhered to this no, JavaScript no, no, to try no, to get no. in. No, wrong. No, okay. No, yeah. JavaScript was first, dude. Uh, so, JavaScript so JavaScript was, was first because applets were cool. And Netscape wanted to get on the hipness of Java applets, which is funny, 
<laughs> right, but that means Java was first. Java was first. Yeah, and so, then, okay. and then yeah. they picked the name JavaScript based on because they liked Java as a because Java was hip. Oh, you're saying the name uh, before yeah. I, yeah. And the then they, was right before ECMAScript. Right, then they I standardized it. it as ECMAScript after that. Oh, so were they naming it JavaScript or like that was probably the original uh, name for applets and then they just went for applets instead? No, or, I, no, applets were just a Java thing. Sun was just doing Java. They had their applets. Everyone right. was like, wow, we can have code on the web pages. That was the best thing ever. Yeah. And then Netscape wanted to, they had, I think it was LiveScript first, wasn't it? Um, I can't remember, but they, they they wanted a scripting language for the web, right? Right, right. Um, and they just asked, they worked with Sun to use the name JavaScript because Java applets were popular. Uh, so it was just purely okay. marketing so, thing. And I think yeah. they, they actually tried to make it look more like JavaScript, Java, than it did at right. first. Right, right. Because right. they were and, riding so that wave. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and and now there's what a Twitter war going on between JavaScript and Java. Right, right. And uh, just to fill in uh, before we discuss that. So Oracle does own the JavaScript name. So just wanted to make sure of that. So, yeah, and I guess they had someone creative-ish uh, or trollish. I don't know. Creative <laughs> or a troll. I don't know. Uh, but it was just like, you know, hey, Java. Uh, you know, it's a few other things that we have we have in the show notes, uh, just trying to, you know, troll uh, Java developers, but as well as like, you know, gather all the JavaScripters together. So, yeah, Java's terrible. Right. <laughs> and so it caused uh, caused this controversy. And so, uh, yeah, we put that there. So, yeah, that's that's a little so bit of the story. And that happened last weekend. Interesting. And I think there's there's some, you know, pride as being being a, J a Java developer, being part of that community, having learned like, again, that vertical wall of uh, the learning curve of type type safe programming coming from a JavaScript background where everything's dynamic and you barely have to even know what a type is. Um, there's a little bit of, uh, you know, condescension there. But I, th I think today, if you compare our Java and JavaScript today, like, what are you really complaining about? I mean, J JavaScript. ECMAScript, the newer versions have classes, they have types, they have, uh, uh, especially with TypeScript, you, you, there's not much difference really between Java and TypeScript in terms of object-oriented program. You can do inheritance, you can have interfaces, you can you have generics. What more do you want? Like you have a fully functional, fully featured programming language. Uh, so what, what is the debate today really between JavaScript and Java? Well, people just don't want to use web logic if they don't have to. That's it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. I found the original tweet. The uh, It was from JavaScript. Quick question for you. What do you like most about Java? Wrong answers only. And uh, that's where it started. <laughs> that's yeah. where it started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see it now. All right. I'm, I'm going to put that on the show notes. Yeah. yeah I, I don't know. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get in language wars. I spent a lot of time doing both. Um, and um but the ecosystems are pretty different so you know i i yes. have um i've been working with uh, baki schultz who's done a lot of jsf stuff um but on on some of my projects you know we're doing we're doing more javascript stuff um and it's been interesting watching him because he's definitely like a hardcore java guy but he's brilliant so he's like jumping into stuff you know and gets a handle on it quickly but there's some stuff he's like how come i'm using you know uh, ES6 modules and I can't import anything. It's like, well, because you have to use a bundler because there's like 12 different Java right. module formats. Right, right. And you and you can't use any of them really unless you have something that turns them all in the same thing. Right. You know, there's all sorts of weirdness like that. So they're just different ecosystems. And I think that's yeah, that, that, that part of it's a little simpler in Java because that that's been yes, consistent yes. all the time. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 At least that's what Angular solves in a large, to a large extent is uh, creating libraries, modularization of your code, uh, reuse. So it, it's, and with NPM and semantic versioning, you get like a pretty decent dependency management. Um, it supports dependency injection out of the box. So really it's a golden age to be a front-end developer right now, I think. I mean, but uh, yeah. It's, yeah. And so, Matt, a question for you. Do, you. do you see Java's role shifting or receding or pulling back from the front end and becoming more of a middle middleware kind of programming language, like microservices API driven kind of uh, 
model or do you still see Java having like uh, James Gosling's been tweeting about uh, um, uh, the uh, what was the latest uh, incarnation of uh, the, the Java front end uh, uh, Java framework? Fx. That's Java the one, Java Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. He, he promotes NetBeans all the time too. So I don't know if I give him a whole lot of credit. <laughs> like, hey, 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 Josh is a huge NetBeans fan. So, hey, I do I'm like just NetBeans. saying that the general population, right. Of Java developers <laughs> is like, you know, they like IntelliJ and, uh, and, you know, Java FX is still a niche. And why I think it's still a niche is because it doesn't have support for OIDC. Right. And that's like a modern way of mm. adding authentication to your apps. And, the only thing that we found is like some Microsoft project that only runs on Java 8, right? And so it's not like uh, people are doing stuff, but they're not investing in like the latest standards and stuff like that, at least in my world, right? The authentication world. So I think it has moved to the back end. And, and part of that is, you know, I realized that as AngularJS came about, like my talk comparing web frameworks was no longer like relevant. And people weren't that interested in it, right? So like it stopped getting denied or it started getting denied from conferences and stuff. And then I was like, I started doing a talk on like modern web development for Java developers. And that was very much trying to encourage Java developers to like learn this shit, right? Study AngularJS, study Bootstrap, like learn these web technologies because that's where it's going and it's still gone there, right? And so I think, you know, Jay Hipster is very much of like a feel for that, right? Where everything's front end, but the one thing we were doing in JHipster wrong that we didn't even realize till a couple of years ago was uh, was we're generating microservices, but when we're generating that client front end, we're always generating it on the gateway. So we're actually generating a monolithic UI, which is a terrible idea, right? Like your whole point of microservices is to have independent deployable units and it's never coupled anywhere. Well, we were coupling it on the UI. So we've only recently in the last year added micro front end supports. So that oh, cool. means your, your microservice has your front end and then when you deploy it all, it all aggregates together, right? But it, it allows you to just develop on that microservice and the front end is pulled in through module federation to the to the gateway, you know, eventually. Nice. Yeah, yeah so, but just uh, how are you guys implementing microservices? I mean, micro, uh, micro front ends, I'm curious about that. With the Webpack module federation in Webpack 5. Fascinating, okay, let's take a look at that. I also have a question too. So, I, yeah, you mentioned how like composition, and it, it does talk about Kubernetes actually on your technology stack page for for J Hipster. So, I'm just curious to know what's your thought on that? Like, um, how do how does orchestration and container containerization change the landscape for application developers? Well, it's the whole deployment model, right? The fact that you only need a Docker container and you don't actually you can put it somewhere and grab it later on a different you know cloud service or whatever and you know, JHipster, I love it because there's so much YAML for Kubernetes, right? And the fact that JHipster generates that for you is just nice. brilliant, right? I, I really nice. like that a lot. Um, I do think it's funny, though. I recently wrote a post last summer on, like, Kubernetes and security and how to deploy it. And one of the biggest, like, craziest things I found was Kubernetes secrets are not secret at all. They're just base 64 encoded strings, right? They're, like, the worst kind of mm -hmm. secret in the world. And so, like, just seeing, like... Even how Jay Hipster did it, like storing database passwords right in your YAML as a secret is like, this is so dumb. Someone could copy and decode that and they know what it is, right? And so like I discovered some cool projects. One was a uh, sealed secrets, which is now on uh, ThoughtWorks like radar of like, you know, adopt or whatever. So right. Cube that's seal. a cool way to do it. Nice. Yeah, cube seal. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so I think, it, you know, it's really cool and it all works. But what I found with deploying like Jay Hipster to most clouds, like with their free tiers is often it doesn't work because they don't give you enough, right? They don't give you enough like default, default machines or whatever. So I've done a lot of trial and error just trying to get things to work, you know, and figuring out like the minimum memory settings and stuff like that. I doubt companies really deal with that that much because they're like, give it all the memory it needs, right? And <laughs> let it run. Yeah. yeah. And so you talked hard. about, that's, this is great. I, you talked about uh, the jar file approach, right? And war files. So this came up recently in the news, right? Spring for Shell. Obviously, we're we're all conscious of security, especially Matt. You work for a company that's deeply invested in security, and yep. we're all conscious of it, right? So uh, our applications, the code we're, we're maintaining, the code we're using, uh, we're very conscious of it. And so Spring for Shell, right? Let's talk about that for a sec. The recent news. Um, Zero day vulnerability was announced. So if you're using um, JDK nine, Tomcat. Spring Web MVC, and you're packaging your code as a WAR file, you're in big trouble because there's a zero day vulnerability out there that could take over your, your code. So 
Uh, the question about, um, yeah, what, let's talk about that for a sec, security and and also um, microservices. So yeah, how, how do you, like, if you start packaging your code as, as a jar file, and Dan, you can Dan, you can you can jump in here. And I know there's a lot of alternatives to the WAR file, right? So how should developers organize their code and deploy their code? I mean, um, don't want to get stuck on the on the WAR file too much, but microservices. I thought you know the idea is like you have one endpoint, you know, one API endpoint basically, and you can scale it up or down as much as you need instead of the old you know approach where you had a web service, which is a WAR file with like maybe a dozen different endpoints. Um, and yeah, how, how do you guys approach your, you know, microservices today? Like, is there a framework that you guys recommend or just a general approach? I mean, it's still a huge in, you know, Spring Boot and Spring like Cloud, they made microservices possible for a lot of Java developers, right? And it was super easy to like whip up and, you know, use Eureka to discover and all that. So I think that's still very popular, but I do think like, Docker is now the new war file, right? War files right. back in the day used to be like, you can run it on any app server. So it's great. Right. And now they're like, no, just give me a Docker container. Right. Yeah. I don't even need Java installed. Right. I just need Docker. So I think and, it has changed in that way. And actually yeah. I was, I was looking, cause you know, I still have legacy clients. I, I, I still get a JSF for Matt. <laughs> so, <laughs> nice. so um, I, you know, I have legacy clients that for whatever reason that, you know, are not migrating that code. Actually, there's one client where it's like, they're migrating it, but not for a couple of years. So we've got to keep it going. But I've spent a lot of time in the last year looking with like WebSphere, like the old WebSphere heavy console oh, stuff. And it's like, and it really helps you realize sort of, because all of their admin stuff has all these federation tools and all these tools for managing multiple servers and stuff. It's like, oh, this is like Kubernetes, <laughs> but it's only for managing web spheres, right? Right. So it's like, it's like yeah, you can have all these different web sphere instances. You can push configuration changes to them all. You can start and stop them all. It's like and, JBoss, uh, JBoss domain mode, right? This is a similar idea. Yeah, it's the same idea. So it's like it's like they built all this stuff, but it was all for only Java containers. And now we have that for Docker containers. So you can use it for any technology, which is certainly a lot more powerful. Right. right. Yeah. And I mean, I've written blog posts on Docker and React, which shouldn't be a topic, right? But it gets tons of hits because people are interested in Dockerizing the React app for, for deployment, you know? Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, I can totally right. see that. Yeah, yeah, and I was looking, I have one talk I do on different um, uh, uh, different function of a server, as a service architecture. So like comparing Lambdas to Google Cloud functions and, my, and Azure functions. And it's like, you know, at the end of the day, they're all just containers that are managed. I mean, that's really all they are. It's just another set of containers, which you you just you just aren't managing them. Right. You right. know, um, after a few years, everything plateaus uh, as far as knowledge goes. I mean, yeah, I, I don't want to be like the naive person that says, <laughs> oh, nothing new could be invented. Uh, but things are always new and invented and it's always really exciting how we push it. But those things that are new invented are of course are on the shoulders of other giants that we recognize these patterns and things start to plateau after a while. Yeah. So, so yeah. And just to definitely, uh, sorry guys to want to jump in on, on you there. Um, but yeah, in terms of the security topic, right. Um, we have different tools today we can use to, to, to address that as well. So I wanted to talk about snick.io um, at some point, but yeah, go ahead. We'll come back to that. I just wanted to close out the spring for shell uh, uh, topic. Has anyone run into it? Because I, w with my clients, like they all check them like, oh, but we're clear because it's not a very common deployment these days. To, uh, you know, for newer apps to have, uh, you know, spring running on uh, Tomcat. Um, but I didn't know if anyone else had run into it um, with any of their clients or any of their work. My website, rabeldesigns.com, is a spring app because it uses Apache Roller and it does run on Tomcat. But because I've been so negligent in updating it, which is funny because I'm always promoting like Java 17 and the latest versions and stuff, it still runs on Java like eight. So I don't have to worry because it's Java nine and above, right? But it is a war file and is on Tomcat. Like it could have been kind of ugly if it affected all the Can you imagine if the world was like uh, treated uh, every, you know, programmers as celebrities? 
and like you would be front page on National Enquirer there, Matt. You'd be like, oh, he's promoting <laughs> 17, but what's his real his secret? Eight. His <laughs> blog what, is his what, eight. What if you were a politician, man? You'd be screwed. Oh, oh my credibility would be shot, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, no, he's lying. He doesn't even use it himself. Right. Actually, I think there are still probably a lot of people using Java 8 out there for web applications but, and stuff. Yeah, but, you know. For sure, yeah. And yeah. now this is just giving them like, you know, more fuel for why they should stay on it. Because yeah. it's like, well. <laughs> it's, it, it's interesting. You can almost, I remember I haven't upgraded either. I have several deployments running on JDK 8. But there, what happened between JDK 8 and JDK 9, right? You had Oracle introducing the, the licensing change. It was a big shift. Like they, they wanted to start charging for every JDK deployment uh, in a business environment, right? So I think there's some concern. A lot of people started shifting towards open JDK. And at least that's what I observed. Like, I think they they may have changed the licensing terms at some point, but it's still since commercial. Then, I, I mean, I think, I think there was... Yeah, I think there was a technical reason, though. Uh, I mean, the licensing did, uh, uh, you know, get some fear into uh, some of the others. But technically, I think it was the module system. Yeah, the module uh, that uh, like that, that kind of like freaked others out. Just like, oh my gosh, what do we do? Uh, right. I don't want to rock the boat too much. Uh, and is this even going to work with my build tool? Is this going to work well, with my build system? Yeah, and it, it was an issue at first, but you know that was a long <laughs> time ago. And also, Spring was like, a big thing, right? Like Spring yeah. didn't have support for it for a while. And so once Spring got upgraded, that mm -hmm. automatically updated like 50% of Java developers yeah, they were all using true. Spring, right? Right. And I think, and, you know, with what they're doing for Spring 6, where they're making it 17 and above, I think that's going to pull a lot of people ahead too, right? I was too, right? so thrilled to see that. I mean, that was right? just like awesome. That's a good idea. Yeah. And like, you know, I... I, whenever I'm on a project, there's there's always just like those few language features. It's like I I want var back when I'm on a project using an older version of the JDK. I can't use var because I I like the type inference. You know, it's I mean I'm used to it from like TypeScript and you know so hey. Uh, so. But there's a ton of projects even like J Hipster, right? We still run on Java eight because well there's not that many cool features that we really want to use, but I think, yeah. you know, for us, we're going to baseline on spring and then we're going to be like, okay, well, I guess we're 17 and above now. Yep. Right. So it really pulls like all the libraries ahead of two, I think. Yeah. I think that's awesome. So mission. if you're, if you're, uh, at least in the Perl community, laziness is a virtue, right? So if you're a lazy programmer, Perl community, and, what? Yeah. Perl, you Perl. Say Perl community. I did say Perl. I talked about is, Perl. Larry there Wall. Is there a Perl communities? There was. There still. I think there still is. But yeah, they, the you know Larry Wall. I mean, I think I remember like twenty years ago writing 89? Perl. <laughs> well, it became you know Ruby was inspired by Perl, so it has it has its place in the uh, you know the, the history books. But oh, it's, it definitely does. So don't get me wrong. I, I did a lot I, of text parsing. Yes. So laziness, right? Laziness is a virtue. So it means, you know, let, do the least amount of work possible to get the job done. It's a good thing. So if you're a lazy Java programmer and you're concerned about security and you haven't upgraded to JDK 9, which in a way is a good thing, but, you know, or if you have and you want to know if your code is vulnerable, there's a great tool out there. I just wanted to, to call it out. It's called snyk.io, S-N-Y-K.io. And this thing's fantastic, guys. I want to share a little bit about this because I've been using it. I'm lazy. I want to know if my code is vulnerable and this thing, I gave it the keys to my GitHub account and it just goes in there. It scans all my repos and it sends pull requests to patch vulnerabilities in your code. I mean, how much easier can it be? It sends you like, here's a new palm.xml file with the patch, merge it to your uh, you know, so release branch. So this is over and above what you get from the from the GitHub depend bot, I guess. It scans everything, man. It scans Docker files. It scans like nice. your uh, Java code, front end code, back end code, everything. And your, your really, question is: Is it called Snick or Sneak? It's sneak or, or Snick, snake. yeah, exactly. Or Snake? Who knows? <laughs> yeah. I think it's Snick personally, but I couldn't find it. How this is how to say it page on the yeah. website so <laughs> it's very like, helpful it told it told me i wasn't washing my hands thoroughly enough before preparing food like it really gets into your life uh, okay <laughs> we're a security experts so you don't have to be that's their their sales page but uh no if you haven't upgraded you're a lazy programmer and you'll you survive by by default but <clears throat> might get and a, I can, impacted. 
I can for, even... for those guys. So Simon yeah. Maple is one of their employees, right? As well as uh, Brian mm-hmm. Vermeer. And I've done talks with both of those guys. And I've recently had some really like close coworkers that went and worked there from Okta. So that's how I know it's a good Trust company, me. right? Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Looks very pretty cool. cool. And I like the fact that it's not, um, cause I, I use, uh, my, my, my little company uses a bit bucket a lot. So I'm, I'm glad it's not only GitHub because, you know, no. whenever something's only GitHub, it's like, that's great for the random repos I have in GitHub right. like, for the right. stuff that I'm doing, like for my clients. So, um, yeah, it's cool. kind of like having cool. a security focused developer on your team who's scanning your code and looking, I mean, who wants to spend time on security? It's so boring, but you have to do it. Like it's, you can't, it's, it's not boring if you're a security guru, you're, you're, you're no. just not. Well, but then the excitement see, is see, the amount my, of money. I would be happy doing that. Is it really yeah. exciting? Is security exciting? Like seriously, <laughs> I just I like patched the zero day today, guys. I patched it. Right. So if you're keto, he would be excited because he's like into the OAuth two spec, right? And he's always you know <laughs> trying to use the spec, right? Versus I just use Spring Security and it's super boring, and I only have to configure you know five lines of code for every any app. So, <laughs> so that's I have, exciting. I have that's a um, I have a argument against uh, just to poke holes at it. Uh, do you really need to give Snick or Sneak or Snake uh, access to your repo? That seems like no, overkill. No. Can't, st- can't static analysis do it? Oh, yeah. And you Docker can. scanning and all these other tools, can they just do it? And you just make it a part of CICD? Why do I have to hand the keys no, to the, I, of my door over to them? You're absolutely right. You don't have to. It's an opt-in feature, but I tried it out. I, because like I said, I'm lazy. I wanted to see what could this thing do. I gave it some low priority repos and I just to see what it would do. And I was impressed. Like it, and it sends you emails. It's, yeah. it's on board. I, I think, I think Daniel, but you're talking more about like, you know, the benefits of scanning the code versus the, the binaries essentially. Right. Or the compiled I mean, output. you know, letting someone in, you know, you know, the thing, like every house guess is fine until your beer is gone. Right. So, but right. I, I I think secure because I, I worked for a pretty security conscious com- company for a while, and they um they use GitHub Enterprise Security. That's pretty much the same thing. Oh you know, yeah, okay. It would it would look at your source code repository and found all these things that that the the default GitHub scanning doesn't do. Um, right. So, so it's a matter of trust. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. I, I, I think I think if if you if that's something you're really concerned about, like you're willing to you know set it up. And I would hope that. Given their um, their uh, market, that they they're pretty secure in terms of how <laughs> they access things. We right. think and so. Yeah. I know it's good because we actually have it integrated in JHipster. So if you have a JHipster project oh, cool. and you type JHipsterCI dash CD, it'll prompt you whether you want to do like Circle CI or GitHub Actions or Jenkins or whatever, and then generate the files for you. And there is a question in there like, do you want to integrate Sneak? So. Oh, nice um, Sneak. Yeah. Nice. And and I like Matt, I, I have a request, even though I don't use JHipster, but I'm going to mm-hmm. say this anyways. Uh, you, you guys should add a Bitbucket pipeline support. So, just a suggestion there. It might be in there. Let oh. me see here. I well, it wasn't on my initial search, but you know that was during the podcast for while we were talking. Let's see, so. JHipster CI CD. See which options it gives me: Jenkins, Azure pipelines, GitLab CI, GitHub Actions, Travis CI, which we should probably remove, right? Why? Circle CI. Well, that's kind of is gone on the wayside. Travis not, it's, GitHub man, Actions probably it killed so it off. Fast. Maybe so. They're probably yeah, and good. they changed their model a bit, right? They changed it from like free for open source to like you got to pay. And they got bought by like a one of these weird like companies that buys software and isn't really a uh, software company. Yeah, that's <laughs> where, where, else can, where else can you can you run a, a build with 15 Macs at the same time in parallel? Like, I don't know any other CI, CD environments that support Mac-based build process. So yeah, they do. Jenkins does. Well, they all do. Hmm. But you have to run your own infrastructure, right? I mean, you have to deploy for your Macs. Not on GitHub yes. Actions. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, not on GitHub Actions. You can do Macs on GitHub Actions. But where does the code, where does the build run? Who owns the Mac? It's your own Mac? Microsoft. No, Microsoft. Oh, they, right. they have, they can, you can say, I want like five agent build process and they can scale up. Oh, I don't know about that. I don't know if you can do that. Yeah, right? that's, so that's Travis CI does that. Is the, how, so many, how many just let agents you... do you want kind of thing? That's kind of right, cool. but you got to pay for it. I'm sure they all yeah. do some things when you pay for it, right? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. use it for free. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I, I don't mind paying for it. It's just I, there's no other place that I'm aware of that lets you do it. I'm running like a three agent Mac build process that, out of my office, but that's on a Mac Mini, a Mac Pro, and a, and a MacBook. 
and I'm right. using bam, like bamboo to run the, the, the remote agents. So, right. but you know, if I wanted to, I've, you know, for one project, I've, I don't know, I could be, there could be 20 repos with changes in it at, at any given time. And that's going to take time to build. That's it. Like three agents building 20 repos. So like three at a time, you know, five minute build next repo. Five I'm minute sure. Build. I'm sure if you pay for it, someone will happily spin up a Mac instance for you. Uh, I would love to know, or Docker, you know, I could run, if, if Apple would let you run Mac in a Docker container, I mean, the problem solved, but good luck. Yeah, anyway, nice. <laughs> that would be nice. Yeah. Cause we're, we're doing, um, iOS development for one of my clients and like, oh, they, man. They, they bought a couple of Mac minis for us. Cause we're like, well, are we going to do anything on your infrastructure? You know, we have Macs. You know um, what? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, if if you could run uh, Apple uh, Mac OS in containers, maybe they could call it Applets. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. That's cool. So, um, so I just want to mention a couple of news items before you forget. Uh, did you want to say anything about um, Glassfish Seven? Uh, was that you, Josh? Yeah, I can just mention it real quick. This is certainly not something that is going to be. <clears throat> Uh, shaking the earth right at this point because it's milestone, uh, but it is important to mention that we're finally getting to Jakarta EE 10 release it's coming up soon. I think in May mm -hmm. is when they're expecting it, and uh, this uh, Glassfish version is uh, going to work with Jakarta EE 10, and it will also work with JDK 11 and also, I believe, 17. So pretty good for upgrading in the uh, Jakarta EE space, so keep an eye on that. Nice. And uh, it's, nice. it's so fascinating. You see the versions now. It's like Servlet 6. Wow. Yeah. Sounds like, Hell <laughs> like yeah. a, you know, an old version of Servlet. So, yeah. And I think we all have like uh, memories of that copper kettle book uh, for Servlet programming. Yeah. That sounds familiar. Yeah. I, I still remember one of my first gigs I, I wrote because before there were JSPs, <laughs> I wrote a little templating engine with Servlets. Nice. <laughs> I was all proud of myself. Yeah, sick. that's good. That's good. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, so that's cool. Um, so Jakarta E is nine coming out, and also along the Jakarta EE um, front, there's uh, the Jakarta EE starter. So if you go to start Jakarta EE, I'm sorry, start Jakarta EE. Excuse me. Um, you can have some maybe archetypes that will very easily allow you to create um, a new Jakarta EE project. So n n nothing quite as extensive as JHipster, but you will get a basic app um, <laughs> that you can uh, that you can start with. So it's sort of like the the starters that you find at Micro Profile or or Spring, but yeah. a little little bit less hip, but same idea. Good starting point for microservices and whatnot. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Either way, keto less hip. I saw what you did there. <laughs> You know, I, I I wish I was cool enough to have thought of that, but I, mm -hmm. I'm really good at saying. Like, just go with it. Just go with it. I'll it, cover so. for you. <laughs> all right, cool. Um, all right, and uh, Josh, you have the NetBeans, I'm guessing. Yeah, NetBeans 13 is released, and it is um, probably, as Matt had mentioned, uh, may not be the most widely used uh, uh, IDE out there, but it, this one does still have, pack a punch. There's quite a few nice features in it. My favorite feature, I have to say, is the new flat look and feel. It really does give you a nice uh, feel when you're using the IDE, a lot different than it used to be um, for years, I mean. Uh, so it looks nice. But there are a lot of job updates, Maven updates, great old groovy. Um, so quite a few uh, enhancements in this release. So it would be a good one to go out there and pick up. Hey, there's even PHP additions. Yeah. So, there. so guys, PHP. I got to ask the, the IDE elephant in the room question. What's going on with Eclipse? Do people still use that or is it? Yes, they yeah. still use it. Yep. And I'll tell you because Bakke uses it. And, and, you know, and actually, we we ended up using it for for this client because they um they used to use rational application developer 
Um, so I figured there was a better chance than using clips. In retrospect, we probably could use something else, but whatever. has it aged well? I mean, if you compare no. it with like uh, Jet Brains, oh my gosh! I, like, no, I have, a, I have a fast computer, and I've never seen so many beach balls as when I'm using Eclipse. No, no, I, I still, I mean, I use it on that one project, um, but I, I would never use it on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> and the dark, dark mode like have you tried to get you know at least jet brains oh my gosh oh, it's like all the... weird on the mac it's like it yeah it it's like things are all messed up or yeah and you have to go tested. in and, and fine tune because it's like the black text on a black background or all of a sudden it's like come on guys you didn't think you didn't test that like dark mode nobody thought that, that they're using dark mode now now I, to it to its credit i do have to remember like some of the shortcuts i'm like oh yeah so i really can search by type or you know like those are more, great no you know, don't get me wrong Eclipse shortcuts rock. I'm sorry. The, the, I, I know, Dano, you love uh, JetBrains for many years. Refactoring, I know you said you said it before, JetBrains is great for refactoring, but Eclipse refactoring is on the next level. I'm sorry. like that, It's more powerful, right? There's, there's almost... No. Uh, <laughs> no, you don't have to apologize for being tell me, wrong. Tell me, like, you can, do a, can you do pull up and push down in JetBrains? Can you do that, that kind of refactoring in, in JetBrains? I pull up meaning, meaning pull, into, uh, pull, pull this pull this public method in, up to a super class and make yes, it yes yes you can yes. do that yeah mm -hmm. yeah okay and it'll go and so. refactor all your code and it's fast yeah. and it's and it doesn't mess up yeah okay yeah, totally. I, in my experience the people that are still using eclipse are the ones that are like java all day every day right, right. and the people that <laughs> if they do like some web technologies or whatever they'll, they'll quickly like i think even netbeans is better no. Right. For sure. Where, where they're like, okay, I got to use something else. Right. Or VS code, right. VS codes become hugely popular among yeah. like people that use J hipster. Yeah. I, oh, yeah. I go back and forth Listen. between VS code and, and uh, IntelliJ, depending on what I, yeah. what, what all you need to do is Intel and IntelliJ control T. Yes. Watch the, watch the, the searching. Distance. Yeah. The fine, the fine dialogue in Eclipse is like, hasn't, hasn't changed in 10 no, years. No, it hasn't. But, in JetBrains, oh my gosh, yeah, shift, shift, and find anything. I love that. Like, uh, oh, find, totally. find, oh, and then spray. there's control, and then there's control, control, which is run anything. Oh, oh. cool. Mm. Nice. Mm. <laughs> nice. Mm. Mm. <laughs> All right. So, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just, uh, he, he's very happy about his idea. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Once he once Ian was like, does this do it? Does this uh can you do this in an intelligent? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> well, what, what's funny is like I, you know, each when I was starting your project, I think there's something I want to do differently, right? So there's a project I started recently. I was like, well, let me I'm just I'm just gonna use VS Code this time. Yeah, I haven't used it in, I hadn't used it in like a year or two constantly. And you know, I really like it. And I um, you know, there was one, you know, the Git support that, that ships with is okay. But, you know, the minute you start doing stuff, you're like, well, I need, like, to be able to compare against a previous revision in the same branch. How do I do that? So, you know, at first I'm like, man, this is why yeah. I like IntelliJ, because it has all that stuff built oh, yeah. in. But the version then, control you know, is it did take me five minutes to find the, the, the right plugin for VS Code. So, yeah. so on the one hand, it's annoying because anything you want to do, you got to find a plugin for it. Um, yeah. But on the other hand, the plugins are installed really fast and they're, they're generally. Right. Oh yeah. No, it's so. yeah. Yeah. VS code is, is, is very interesting. It has a um, very performant uh, look and feel and implementation. I don't know what, what it's built on, but Type it's speed. very fast. Is it? Yeah. That would make sense for Microsoft. That, that's why it I runs think it's in the funny browser. that so many people hate Electron, right? But it's an Electron <laughs> app, just like Slack is, right? Yeah, good point. <laughs> right, good right. point. And I'll, I'll give uh, VS Code, I'll, I'll give everyone credit. I like Eclipse too. Uh, and, but uh, the thing about Visual Studio <laughs> about Code. NetBeans. Though, yeah, and I like uh, NetBeans was one of my first because uh, okay. I loved, I forgot what it was, uh, the name before NetBeans, but uh, that was one of the first Sun Microsystems, pure, you know, editing experience. And uh, yeah, absolutely love it. Uh, but uh, the thing I like about VS Code is uh, what's I called the server, the server engine that. Yeah, so I forgot what it's called, but yeah, it's, I forgot what it's called. So but, extension, yeah, phase, right? yeah, and uh, compiler engine or something like that. That language uh, service, language server, or something like that. Language server, I think, is what it is. So if Matt Rabel comes out with a new programming language called Rabel, uh, then 
he could just write the server for it and it just works. Like, you know, you don't have to like spend years just trying to, you know, come up with an editor that people use. You just use VS code. And that's why like people who create new languages just go immediately for VS code. I've been trying one called Flix, uh, which is a functional programming language on the JVM. Uh, and you can find that at flix.dev. Uh, but they go, they say, here it is. It's right there under uh, Visual Studio Code because they just created a uh, server engine for it nice. and uh, get going with your new language. Cool. Very interesting. Yeah. Speaking of uh, uh, JetBrains, so jumping into one of our picks, Dano, since you're on the topic, what, tell us about Bytecode View in IntelliJ IDEA. Yeah, absolutely. So Bytecode View is a, a way to uh, right-click on a file and just view the bytecode there. I know it wasn't uh, that big of a deal, but I was talking about bridge method in generics that uh, if you subclass uh, another class with generics uh, and uh, when you do so, a synthetic method is created at the bytecode. And uh, I didn't show it and I'm like, gosh, I really need a quick way to show bytecode on IntelliJ. But there it is, like right there on the menu, show bytecode. And you just see it right then and there. And I think, you know, for things like that, extremely helpful. And I think uh, all of you would like that a lot. I'm sure maybe some of the other editors will have that. So I'll just keep it like a technique. This is a technique that I think every Java developer should have because sometimes nice. you need to know what's going on and you need to take nice. a look at the bytecode. Yeah. So um, I, I've got a question for Matt. So um, so I, 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 I thought that this, this uh, was a very timely podcast because the last couple of days, I've been working with uh, a React app um, that I didn't write. It's written by a completely different team um, that we are wrapping with Capacitor, um, which is a framework from Bionic that lets you run uh, web apps as mobile apps. It's it's just sort of the successor to Apache Cordova, which has been around forever. Right. Um, we had written the previous version with Cordova, and we decided to do this one with, with Capacitor. Um, and so, you know, uh, of course, as luck would have it, um, the uh, app we're using has some built-in authentication that works just fine with the normal React app using Okta. Um, but uh, when we wrap it with Capacitor, of course, it doesn't work. Um, and we went down the road. Uh, Okta has this wonderful widget, the, the, the login widget, the sign-in widget. Um, we tried embedding that in our Capacitor app. and. Uh, and we quickly, what we realized is that we didn't really, we don't really have a good way to hook into the existing uh, authentication that's already built into the app. Um, long story short, we can't really make any changes to it. So, um, so my question for Matt, because I, I ran across an article from him about uh, Capacitor and uh, actually I think the article I ran about was Ionic um, for, so it was in Cordova um, and Okta. Uh, and then I ended up using your your uh, your Angular and Okta um, schematics uh, to sort of get a handle on how it's theoretically supposed to work. So, so I can understand how that works to see how we could replicate it with what we're actually doing. Um, so, uh, however, the the people that are involved with the other app claim that they've got it to work with Capacitor using just normal the normal Okta login stuff without going to any embedded browsers or anything without like any special plugins. So what I'm wondering is like, what have you seen? Like, what have you seen work for people? Oh, uh, this has been like my life at Okta. I was one of the only ones that seems like in all of engineering, right. That cares about like Ionic. Cause we don't have any SDKs for Ionic, but we have them for like react yeah. native and stuff like that. And so the biggest thing that I thought in the beginning, it took me years to get them to add it was capacitor colon slash slash localhost as a trusted origin, right? right? So what's happening when you use like the Okta SDKs, whether it's a React or an Angular one, is it's actually blocking you when you try to authenticate because that trusted origin wasn't there. And all we allowed was HTTP origins up until like a year ago, right? And it's one of those things that you don't really see like in your browser console because you're on a phone, right? There's no browser console a lot of times. And so it's like one of those errors that just kind of dies in the night, right? You never really know what's happening. You just know it doesn't work. And so I spent a year trying to get like, or several years to get them to add that. And then they added it. And I think I did like a 10 minute test. I did it with like the Angular SDK, which does a redirect. And I did it with like our sign-in widget as well. 
and I couldn't get either one of them to work. But I do have a link to a GitHub repo where someone commented how they did it. So you can use a sign in widget in a capacitor app and talk to Okta. I think they use like the native HTTP module from Ionic instead of they like override the requester basically. Yeah. And that, that doesn't, you know, it works. So I'll try to dig that up for you. Okay. Okay. I, I think I saw that, but I'll certainly look at it again. Interesting. But I haven't yeah. tried recently. So what I what I do right now is I use uh, Ionic app auth. And yes, so I saw that's that a project too. that's out there. They have a React example as well. And yeah. that pops a browser. And then how you typically do it is you have a schema defined for your app, right? So if you're on an Okta developer account, it might be dev, you know, one, two, three, four, five dot Okta.com. So you use a reverse version of that, com dot, you know, Okta dot whatever. And so that's how you basically identify your app to the operating system, right? So when it does a redirect, it comes back to that URL and it's like colon slash slash callback or whatever, but that'll pop up your app. And then you have a handler for that callback and then you're authenticated, right? Right. Right. Okay. And this, that's, that's, that, that is what I saw. So I think, I think the main issue is getting, getting access into the built-in authentication stuff that this library is using. Cause the way there's also a, there's, it's interesting. Ionic offers like a app auth service. And I recently talked to a guy about it who's having a similar problem to you, right? Like trying to use Ionic app auth or whatever. And I was like, well, you know, if you just want to pay for Ionics, you know, it supports Okta and Auth0 and whatnot. And he said it was 20 grand a year. So it's not like a very cheap service, right? I mean, wow. Yes, yes. No, I, it's funny because, you know, when you start working with a company's product, you get a handle of their business model and their ecosystem, right? So, right. you know, I have not used Ionic on, on normal you know, web projects, you know, but whenever I'm doing mobile stuff, I end up looking at Capacitor or Cordova, and then I see all the Ionic stuff and I look at their pricing. And I, I've been trying to convince uh, my client to use their, they have this build service now where I, right, yeah. it's called AppFlow or something. And it's like, yeah, well, it'll do CICD and deploy to the app store for you. I'm like, hmm. <laughs> Interesting. I got a question about that. This looks fascinating, by the way, Ionic. And I'm, I have a question because as an Angular developer doing responsive web design and building for for uh, um, building out. So we lost someone. Dano had to go, right? Yeah, Dano okay. had to go. So um, just uh, curious, how do you guys address the issue of user experience, right? Users are expecting to interact with native widgets. When you present, a, a, for lack of a better word, a synthetic widget on the on the mobile device, they know it's like you know there's a slight uh, clue si signals that this is not a native button or a native date picker or it's not really a native mobile component. So how do you how does Ionic handle that? Like does it? Um, I mean, the best fastest you know rendered HTML is still going to be HTML on the screen. It's not a. I wish I wish the user experience was at par with native mobile components, but I mean, how do you address that? It looks like a native component for the most part, at least recently. And, and, you know, a lot of what they've done to embrace like react and, and view and things like that is, uh, is made it more of like, those are web components. Right. Okay. And, uh, and for the most part, like when I pull up an iOS app that I wrote with Ionic, like it definitely looks like an iOS app, right? There's not, I mean, all the components are very similar and all the buttons are very similar, right? So, okay. Yeah. So it's, you're saying it's indistinguishable from a native mobile app. Like you can't tell the difference. Like for me developing example apps, but I, I've certainly used apps, right? For instance, like in Colorado, we have sports betting now. I'm a big sports fan. So I, you know, I use like BetMGM app and it's got to be an Ionic app or something like that. And it's totally kludgy, right? They need to rewrite it as a native app because it's like, you could just tell that it's loading web pages all the time and you're like, this is not good, you know? So I think, right. you know, if you really want to do a native app, right? You should probably use native code, right? I think it's it's for these companies who want to do maybe a simpler app or a portfolio. It's almost like a website, right? And right. have that as an app, you know? Or if you, you know, or companies that just really don't have the, the budget to build mo mo mobile apps, you know? Um, where, especially like if they, you know, if, if you think about it from their perspective, like if they don't have that many mobile users, we'll have them go to their regular website you know, this is a really quick way for them to get something out the door. Um, right. 
And and also, I think there are, I mean, I think there's a decent number of hybrid apps. We just don't really think about it. But there's a lot of apps where it's like you, you realize you're kind of looking at a web page, you know. Um, and maybe in those cases, it's not Ionic. Maybe it's just a web view that's loading a page. Who knows? But to me, it's like as long as their interaction is not annoying, I don't think people really care that much, you know. Right. So I, you know, think about like the app you use for your bank or for the app you use for your pharmacy. Like, if it actually works and doesn't, right. sit, you, yeah, you don't and, really care if it looks like a native map or a time. Yeah, no, I, I get that. And there's also a huge value proposition there. If your company can build a complex web application that can then scale to mobile and have a reasonably good end user experience, and you don't have to reinvest that same effort twice to build the same app and keep it in sync as it evolves. So for sure, there's definitely benefits, I think, for the mobile web ex user experience. And what about like the HTML5 input types, right? You have like a bunch of different uh, HTML input elements, color, date, time, number, tell, telephone, you know, week, that will render as a native mobile component when running on a mobile uh, device. So, I mean, there's that, there's that approach too, but yeah, I get, the, I get the idea. You want to have a hundred different components in your toolkit, right? So, but yeah, it's a challenge that we, I think, that we face today building web applications for the mobile uh, platform. But uh, yeah, anyway, interesting, interesting material. I think uh, there's lots to learn about yeah, that. Indeed, indeed. Going back to uh, JavaFX real quick, I thought that was one of the original intentions of JavaFX years ago was to make it so that it would deploy on iOS and whatnot. So you could use that as your one stop shop, but they never really got there, did they? Um, no, they, I think they, they actually Gluon are there. Gluon hey. has done it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. I, I, I take a step back. Gluon is there and they've they've done it a couple of years ago, right? They've been up and running. Well, they're, like they're yeah. doing it all with Graal VM, right? They compile to native and then do it that way. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. from what I've seen, it looks pretty cool, but I haven't definitely played with it too much. And yeah, the either. other option in that area is Flutter from Google, which has a decent community and decent that's community. like hugely popular like every yeah. time i post a video on like ionic or act native i always have to delete the comments from the flutter people <laughs> <laughs> yeah so but you know at the end of the day like you know the flutter approach is also like they draw all the widgets like the the reason it it's it's not like they're using the native widgets they're using flutter widgets you know so and it's just it's just it's still not the same as having native you know, so I mean, I know it compiles natively, but you know what I mean. In terms of the widgets, it's not the native widgets. So, all right. So, um, so just if you didn't notice, Dano had to go. Um, he he had a doctor's a virtual doctor's appointment, which he had to get ready for. I guess you know. Um, so, um, I'm trying to think, I, I want to move on to our picks. Um, let's see if there's anything else we want to pick Matt's brain about. Hmm. Maybe some some more philosophical stuff. Like, what would your advice be to to a, a seasoned Java developer today versus somebody just starting out in their career? Like a seasoned Java developer, I'd tell them just to enjoy the ride. And for you know someone that's uh, new, I would you know for me, like my story is very privileged, right? Because even though you know I grew up in the backwoods of Montana, I'm a white guy, and you know I've had a lot of luck in my life, and so. I think, uh, you know, the frameworks thing hasn't been bad to me, right? And now I actually have, you know, a new talk that's comparing Java REST API frameworks. And we were talking about, do you do stuff on the on the front end, you know, in Java anymore? And I'm like, no. And so this new talk is about, you know, building those frameworks like Quarkus and, you know, uh, Micronaut and Spring Boot and Helidon is in there now. Um, and comparing like how they build and how they start and if they fast, you know, they do things fast with Crawl. And, uh, and it's funny because I've had a lot of people like, this seems like your smackdown of older years, right? And <laughs> and I've been able to pull in elements, like I always do these graphs that piss people off because they're comparing like numbers, right? They're saying that this mailing list had this much traffic, so it's a better framework. And people are like, no, it has more problems, you know, and stuff like that. So that's been fun. That's but interesting. I, you know, I so I think, you know, if you're new, like, you know, don't try to write everything yourself, like leverage the frameworks. And, you know, if you... Uh, if you like one, then start blogging about it. And uh, you'll find that learning in public is really, you know, an asset to your career and people 
you know, enjoy learning with you. Cool. So do you see tools like Stack Overflow instrumental in that today, Matt? Like um, how, how would that have, like, how has that changed the landscape as a developer learning in public today? Oh, it's, it's incredible, right? Like I probably post a question, you know, maybe every month or two. Right. And this is basically, I've searched the whole internet, right. And I can't find the answer. And so that's when I end up on stack overflow, but you know, back in 2002 and three, when I was doing all my learning and blogging and stuff, it was, uh, you know, the blogs were stack overflow. There wasn't a stack overflow that had all the information. I remember, you know, experts exchange, right. I used that, oh, a fair yeah, amount, but, yeah. <laughs> but that was about it. Right. And so like, just, it's, it's awesome. Like I tell my son who's getting into programming now, like, uh, you know, I think when you take a programming test or something, you should be able to still use Stack Overflow, right? Because in real life, like you use it so much, right? Or you're finding, like I told him one of my superpowers is remembering keywords and knowing keywords to search for, right? Like, <laughs> because yeah. if you can search for it, you could probably find the answer, you know? Hey, who, uh, who remembers question. Java Wrench? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, that still exists. I, I think still it around. does still exist. Yeah, yeah. I still yeah. get emails from him. Yeah. yeah. I I, uh, I think that was a, somewhere I was we were interviewing people, and that was one of our questions. And it wasn't like, basically, we're trying to get people to admit that they can Google something. You know, it's like, if you don't know how to do this, what do you do? And then you'd be like, oh, I talked to so-and-so. And after a while, you're like, wouldn't you just search Google? Like, what? I, I it's a question you don't like have the were, answer to. They were afraid to admit it, right? <laughs> yes. It was cheating. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, all right. Yes. Um, well, I, I'm thrilled to have had you, Matt. Um, yeah. And uh, let, let's move on to the picks. Um, I have one of uh, two picks today. Uh, first one um, is Stan Stand. Uh, so Stan, Stan Stand is great for uh, those of us who travel. Um, and it is a little portable desk that you can take with you on a trip. Um, and you can basically, it allows you to sort of like, you can set up a little stand, put it on your on a table, and then stand while you're working. Essentially, um, I have one, and yeah, you know who I saw that had one was Venkat, and so I was like, you know, well, I, Venkat's I, gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. <laughs> you know, I I actually I when, 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 before I post put this out of this this uh, pick, I was like, I know someone on some fluff some no fluff just stuff talker mentioned this. I couldn't remember exactly who it was. Like, yeah, it's probably <laughs> Venkat. Yep. Yeah, so I, I don't use this as much because I don't travel as much, but um, but I, I even use it like when I go work at like Starbucks or something now. If I'm if I'm working at a Starbucks all day, I don't want to sit all day. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll bring it along and stand. So very handy. Uh, the other pick I have is Dark Reader, which is an extension for Chrome um, that basically turns any website into dark mode. Um, so that one's really handy if you like dark mode stuff. And you can also... Do it selectively so you can turn it off on some sites and turn it on, on other sites depending on what you want to do so that one's pretty handy so cool. those are my picks i've got a pick i'd like to share um just recently kind of rediscovered plex uh, tv not sure if you guys are familiar with that software of plex um basically uh it's kind of it's been in the news lately for in the context of consumers are getting overwhelmed with all the streaming choices today right so how do you kind of organize what you're what's what you want to watch on uh, when you watch some some streaming so it, it kind of acts like a front end to all your streaming services disney netflix uh hbo whatever you have and and you can search cross services and you can kind of create your own watch list so i recently started using that plus safari on mac which i discovered has this really cool feature when if you're streaming something on Netflix while you're writing code, which I like to do because I like to have some background noise, uh, you can actually uh, right click the volume symbol in the address bar and choose open in uh, picture in picture. So whatever video is on your, in your browser, you can just shoot that over to a pic. Uh, Mac has this great feature called picture in picture, which keeps the, the video window on top of everything, no matter which desktop you're on. So you can switch around this different desktops and you still got your video in the corner. And that that works really well for me. So you know, I can, I, I just for me, I like it. I like it a lot. So Plex.tv cool. and Safari Picture in Picture. I didn't know I'd have not used Picture in Picture, so that's kind of cool. Nice. 
Uh, Dano gave his bytecode uh, pick already, which is awesome. Bytecode view in IntelliJ, which I didn't know existed. I think that's kind of awesome. So, uh, and he also had denotable types. I do not know what those are. Does anyone know, know what those are? I can ask nah. Google. <laughs> Google said denotable types are. We can save that for Dano for the next one. Yeah, if you want. Hmm. Interesting. All right. I'll I'll, I'll leave it up to uh, those who want to guess what it is, or do Google. Um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Josh, you have one. So, yeah, I do have a pick. This is something I've been watching recently. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the Theranos saga, but uh, this oh, yeah. is a tech company that basically was a startup back in the early 2000s and um, had had some great ideas, never panned out and end up committing quite a bit of fraud uh, and going, you know, uh, live with product that essentially didn't work. And uh, it's just amazing when you watch this, uh, this, um, I want to call it like a biography of uh, Elizabeth Holmes, but it's not really a biography, but uh, to, to see how how many different tech companies really were backing this and how much money they got and this product never even worked and it's uh just an amazing story so it's it's, it's worth checking out you may need a hulu subscription to see it so they do uh, have a trial which i've used in the past yeah <laughs> and the thing is only eight uh episodes long so you could probably get through in the trial so is she didn't she recently go to prison that she's not she's not going there yet but she i think her sentencing is in september and she's so facing she's convicted okay yeah and i think she's facing 20 years 20 wow. years excuse me and uh i think four million dollars or something in fines i think uh, I, I, i'm not 100 certain on that i read a little bit about that apparently she's like super super charismatic and everything she probably could have been one of those cult leaders if she had picked something else well she kind of it's it's kind of funny because she uh she wanted to be like the female version of Steve Jobs. So she dresses in all black and, uh, you know, like he does with the, the turtleneck and kind of right. acts, acts like him and, and whatnot and had people from Apple on the board. And I believe, and uh, like uh, Larry uh, Ellison, he was one of the first people on really? the board. And yeah, it's, it's just amazing. It's, it's an amazing story. It just awesome. kind of goes to show you how something can go awry. And I, yeah. I think it just kind of, it was like a snowball on tour and things happened. All right. Yes. Yeah, so I'm adding into my infinite TV shows to watch list. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, I've got a few uh, uh, just uh, things I wanted to mention just about the other um, podcast in the pub house network. So remember there's uh, breaking in open source, which uh, doesn't have any new episodes, but does exist. Um, and that has uh, Josh and uh, Bob Pollen. Uh, talking about open source, you guys should do a do an epi new episode, and you can get Matt to help you with J hipster stuff. Yeah, that would be a good thing. <laughs> yeah, we we should be doing a new one sometime soon. I mean, we've got a couple of topics picked out, but it's just a matter of finding the time to get it done. Yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. So, um, there's also Off Heap, um, which is another awesome podcast, and uh, there's also the Java Pub House as well. So you can find all these at Pub House Network. Uh, I'm sorry, pubhouse.net. Um, and you can also find our show there as well. Let's uh, so check those out. And I just wanted to mention a few events. Um, the, the, the coolest event, of course, is uh, Java One. So um, if you've been following the, the Java ecosystem, which is quite likely if you listen to this podcast, um, there used to be Java One. Um, and then Oracle bought Sun, who ran, who created Java and ran all the Java One conferences. And then after a couple of years, they changed it to Code One. Um, and sort of messed it up a bit <laughs> to be uh, to be kind, but you know, it, they, they basically it used to be this really awesome, fun conference, and they kind of blended it in the Oracle world. And you know, it, it took a while to find their footing. I, honestly, the last one a few years ago, before the pandemic, actually had gotten a lot better. Um, but it was called Code One, um, and uh, they decided to move to Vegas before the pandemic hit. Um, and now they're finally doing uh, the Oracle world in Vegas, but this time uh, they're actually renamed Code One back to Java One. Woohoo! Nice. So uh, it'll be October um, 16th 
through 22nd. Um, I, I will go there. Even if I'm not speaking, I'll be there. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. Now, I don't know, you know, it's probably not going to be the same as the good old days with the beanbags and uh, office. Um, well, it's the first time it's not in San Francisco, right? It's usually yes. always in San Francisco. So it'll be yeah, a bit so different. It's, yeah. Interesting to see how they do it. Yeah, yeah, I'm curious to see how they do it, but I'm glad they brought the name back because oh, um, yeah. Oracle needs to, I think they've done a great job with the JVM, to be honest, um, and with Growl. Um, and they just need to really, you know, show that they're the company behind Java. Um, and yeah. I think using the name is, putting the name back is a great first step. So, I agree. Um, and, you know, I like Halidon. I think they've done a lot of great stuff lately. So, um, so anyway, so that's October 16th and 22nd. Um, the uh, Jakarta Tech Days are um, virtual sessions that run like once a month all this year. I have a couple coming up, one in May and one later on uh, talking about uh, GraphQL and then one about um, uh, working with the legacy Java EE app. Um, DevNexus, um, April 11th through 13th. Um, which That's next week. Are you going to be there? Yeah, I'm there. Fly right. on Monday, yeah. All right. So... Uh, so, um, and actually by the time you hear this, that probably will have already happened. So, um, but uh, hopefully you'll get to see, uh, are you speaking? Or are you just going to? Hang yeah, out? Okay. yeah, I'm speaking. So you'll see Matt and Dano, but not me, unfortunately. Um, and, and Josh, you're not going, right? Okay, that makes me feel better. Okay, cool. Um, so that, that that's in Atlanta, Georgia. That should be a great conference. That's the first uh, in-person one they've had in a while, so. Um, there's also DevOps France, April 20th through 22nd in Paris, France. Uh, JFocus, May 2nd uh, through 4th in Stockholm, Sweden. I just uh, want so to jump in there real quick. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to interrupt you. I think JFocus may also be virtual. They may have a virtual track uh, as well. So okay. just wanted to mention it. Okay. Unless you're planning on going to Stockholm. I... Yeah. I'll have to go there. That'll be a fun one. Oh, yeah. 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 I... I went there like many, many years ago. I'd love to go back. Um, I'll make note of that. Um, software design and development in uh, London, UK, uh, May 16th through 20th. The Eurostar conference, June 7th through 10th in Copenhagen, Denmark. Agile 2022 in July, uh, July 18th through 20th in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, and also uh, there are a whole bunch of NOFOF just stuff coming up there's uh northern virginia um which will be out in april central ohio uh, central iowa architecture conference great lake symposium uberconf etc so you can find them nfgs.com uh i think or at least nofluffjuststuff.com works <laughs> so uh and you can find us at stackpodcast.com uh and i think we've actually finished before like three hours so it's like a miracle um so uh, I want to thank you again, Matt, for joining us. Um, you should come yeah. back again sometime. Uh, talk about uh, other random Java stories. Uh, <laughs> talk about that this night you were with some 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 rich. Uh, it's funny. I look back at some of the people we knew back in the day, and some of them are like total billionaires now. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> like, like the Atlassian guys and stuff. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that, that's and and uh, Ross Mason too. Uh, right. The Mule yep. sort, Mule Soft. Um, yeah, I don't know if Rod Johnson is a millionaire, but I know he's a billionaire, oh, yeah. but I know he's not. Right, he's, right. I know he's no, happy. he did well. He did well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So, all right. Well, um, any last words, guys? Just thank you again so much, Matt, for joining us and for everything you've done for the Java community and web frameworks in general. And yeah, it was great having you on the show. Thank you. Yeah, My great having you here. <laughs> Excellent. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, um, uh, you can find us again at stackpodcast.com, um, S T A C D podcast.com. And uh, we record once a month. So we will see you around. And also, I never mentioned this, but if you use the Apple Podcast or some other podcast app, you should give us a high rating. You should give us a five star rating. Woohoo. All right. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Bye bye.